38 years ago today, the president of the United States was shot and the person who fired the gun today is a free man. March 30, 1981, Ronald Reagan had only been president for two months as he exited the Washington Hilton following a speech, 25-year-old John Hinckley Jr. was waiting with a revolver and fired six times. Among the injured, a police officer, Secret Service agent, and Press Secretary James Brady, who was shot in the head and spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. President Reagan was struck by a bullet that ricocheted off a limousine. It lodged in his chest. He was rushed to the hospital. He ended up recovering. Hinckley was charged with attempted assassination. But to the surprise of many at the time, the jury found him not guilty by reason of insanity. His motive? He was obsessed with then-teen actress Jodie Foster, who'd starred in a movie called Taxi Driver as a prostitute. In the movie, Robert De Niro's character comes close to committing a political assassination. After numerous attempts to contact Foster and stalking her, Hinckley decided the only way to impress her would be to kill the president. After the verdict, Hinckley was confined to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, where he remained for more than 34 years. Eventually, doctors determined him to be in complete remission and no longer a threat to himself or to others. In September of 2016, John Hinckley Jr. was released to live with his mother in Williamsburg, Virginia. Today, he's 63 years old. So what's his life like now? Joining me now is Del Quinton Wilbur. He wrote this piece in the LA Times. He's also the author of Rawhide Down, the near assassination of Ronald Reagan. Dell, how does he spend his time? You know, he, he's a busy guy in a, as a free man down in Williamsburg. He lives with his mom in a, in a kind of a modest house on a golf course with his brother. And, you know, he shuttles them around. He's like, the, he got his driver's license and became the family chauffeur. He has a lot of doctor's appointments, therapy appointments, and he runs an antique business out of an antique mall. He sells books and antiques. So he's actually kind of a busy guy. What can't he do? You know, he's not allowed to go on the Internet without permission. He's not allowed to um, travel beyond 75 miles from Williamsburg um, without notice. Um, and he's precluded also from, like, he, he's an artist. One of the things that has frustrated him the most over the last, you know, decade or so is that, you know, he's a songwriter. He, he, he plays music. He he paints. He even takes a lot of photographs, but he can't display them with his name. He has to do it anonymously, and he hadn't been allowed to do that before. But now, under the judge's most recent order, with the help of a therapist, he's allowed to do that anonymously to see what people think of his work. I take it that the, the guiding principle is that he can't be perceived as profiting based on this crime. Exactly. And he has a narcissistic personality disorder, too. And what they don't want anything to do to trigger that to make it worse and so he has to he can't engage like for example i think he would really like to engage like most artists or most um, musicians would like to engage with their audience hey did you like it what did you like about this what did you like about that in comments or whatever he can't engage with those who see his artwork because of his narcissism and what you noted he's not he can't profit he's not supposed to profit from this terrible crime he committed has he met with any resistance, as far as you know, in the community where he resides? Well, you know, over the years, there were people down in Williamsburg who were quite concerned that the former assassin, or would-be assassin, was living in um, their neighborhood, their neck of the woods. But he has kept such a low-key profile. Um, when the judge issued his order in November, giving him more freedom from, the hot, from his conditions of release, even more freedom, uh, he relied on these was psychological reports in which Hinckley was interviewed by doctors. And Hinckley made a point of saying, hey, I keep a really low profile out here. I don't want really any, everyone knows my name, but no one really knows what I look like anymore. And the number of people I interviewed, for example, at his grocery store, where he often goes, had no idea he lived in town, no idea what he looked like. It took me three hours to find someone who remembered, knew what he was like, and said, oh, he was very quiet. He opened a door for me. And that's, that's what I could find. Was the Reagan family, is the Reagan family, are they cool with the laxity with which the system has treated him? I'm particularly interested, she's gone, of course, in Nancy Reagan's outlook on John Hinckley, if you know. Well, you know, throughout the years, I interviewed agents, Secret Service agents, who, you know, protected Nancy Reagan. She had a Secret Service detail until she died. And they said that she was always asking questions about Hinckley, where he was and what he was doing. You, you got to put yourself back in, in 1981. This was the worst day of Nancy Reagan's life, the absolute worst day. 
And when my book came out in 2011, Jerry Parr, the agent, the Secret Service agent who saved Reagan's life not once but twice on March 30th, 1981, he was with me. And 30 years later, we were having dinner with Nancy Reagan. And she turned to Jerry and put her arm on his shoulder and said, Jerry, thanks for giving me my life back. And I swear to you, it was like it was still present for her, like she still was reliving that day. So members of the Reagan family are not happy about Hinckley. The doctors who have examined, Hinckley is one of the most closely studied psychological patients probably in U.S. history. And he, they are convinced he's in remission, he's not a danger to himself and others. He's 63, he has hypertension, he's obese, he walks with a limp, he has arthritis. I, he's not, I don't think he's going to be chasing anyone down, uh, you know, as a 63-year-old guy. In, he obviously can't buy a firearm. So, you know, it's, I think the world is probably safe from John Hinckley. Dell, rawhide down, the definitive account of the Reagan assassination. We almost lost him, and many of us didn't realize that at the time. Thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me.